the Bible. And as we come together and do the things that we do in uh, our studies together, the Bible is the first and foremost uh, thing that we want to have with us and that we want to have open. And I invite you to indeed open your Bibles and follow along. We will not have a whole lot of um, uh, scripture in this lesson, and I think it's going to be a short one, but, um, but nonetheless, follow along and, and see that I'm telling you the truth. And as we talked about this morning, being thinking Christians, uh, think about these things. And uh, so as we continue on here today, <clears throat> uh, we want to talk a little bit about the Bible. And, you know, let's read Matthew 4, verse 4 to begin. It, said, but, it says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And, of course, a lot of times in the scriptures, especially when Christ is speaking, he he juxtaposes between the physical and the spiritual. And uh, here we see that juxtaposition again. You know, of course, we understand that in order to live, we must eat. We understand that we have to, that we have to consume things that allow our, body, our physical bodies to have energy and so on. But when we're thinking of spiritual life, the things that the scriptures, the Bible, really helps us with really is how we find out what the mind of God is, how we find out his plan for mankind. Those things will help us to live, and they are more important than the things of this world. That's a, an, ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing subject in many Bible lessons is the, the importance of the physical things, the importance of looking at taking care of the physical or physical or our, 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 um, our spiritual nature rather uh, and, and and not so much uh, relying on the physical things of life that, that we co- become so comfortable with you know we have uh, we are blessed to be in a place where we have air conditioning I for one am thankful for air conditioning every day of the hot summer it's a beautiful thing but again it's not needed Again, we can survive without it. And as we go through our days as, as those that claim Christ, <clears throat> do we find ourselves being able to live without the word? Does your Bible sit on the counter? Does it sit on a shelf in your house and collect dust? And I, I'm, I know I've told you this account ad nauseum over the years, but one of the most memorable things, and I, I will likely never forget the encounter I had with a with a older lady at the fair uh, the Medina County Fair when we were doing that and um, I asked her you know would you like a Bible she stopped by our booth and was talking to us and I asked her if she would like a Bible and she said oh no 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 I know where my Bible is it's in my cedar chest and it's been there since 19 whatever and and that's just a statement upon uh, about it just says so much about how people view the scriptures, how people view the Bible. It's a good thing to have. Of course, you got to have one of those in your house. You know, I have uh, uh, in my possession a family Bible that was passed down from who knows where, how who knows how long ago, in in my ancestry, <clears throat> and it is there. It's folded up in a in, in a blanket, and it's also in a cedar chest, uh, but. Thankfully, we have others that we, that we read. And we should be those that are students of the Bible. In fact, I mentioned this morning, and have also mentioned this quite often, that the, the church needs to be, get back to being those people that are the people of the book. People that are understood uh, to have a, a knowledge of the scriptures. In our friend circle, in, our, in the people that we have sway over in our lives, even maybe in our workplaces, are, are you the one that people know? Well, I, I know that he goes to church, and I know that he's religious, and I know that he studies the scriptures, and if I have a question, I can go to him or her. Uh, it, it, can that be said uh, about each and every one of us? The Bible is how we get there. The Bible is how we uh, get that mind of Christ and how we fill our hearts with the things that God would have it to be full of and not leave any room for the things of this world 
that would drag us down. And so as we continue this evening to think about the Bible, you know, for one thing, it is peculiar. It's a strange book when you really stop and think about it. It was never necessarily copyrighted. Uh, it was the first book off the press when books were being printed. Uh, it, was, it, it was the first, if not one of the first, I believe the first uh, book that came off the press. And it was, it was uh, one that was held in high esteem uh, throughout the ages. It has the widest circulation. I mean, it's, it's a pretty sure thing that you're going to go into a hotel, a motel, anywhere across this world and open up the drawer and find a Gideon's Bible uh, sitting there in, in that drawer or on the counter. You can pretty much uh, expect that most households in, the, in this country anyway, if not the world, have at least a Bible uh, to their name in their possession. You know, it's found in all the libraries, and again, we mentioned hotels, many offices and public waiting stations. It's even found in our courts of law. It's even used in our courts of law for, uh, to, to, for people to affirm that they're telling the truth. Yet again, there's the idea of swearing on the Bible, but that's a whole other lesson in and, in and of itself. <clears throat> but even though the courts have that Bible in their possession, there's also the idea that they're quick to dismiss it. They're quick to dismiss the uh, authority of the scriptures. And that, has some, that is something that has come throughout time. The Bible is peculiar in another way that Christians acclaim it, but then reject its precepts sometimes. And in fact, uh, we, we might even think about using that word Christian to describe people who do not follow the word, who do not follow the will of Christ. And so that's also some food for thought. But there are many who claim Christ, who have a Bible in their possession, and maybe read it often even, and maybe even can recite some things from it, maybe many things from it, yet you'll hear things like, yeah, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that it says that. And so it's, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing. The Bible is, in some ways, a very strange book. But again, as we've already kind of mentioned, it's popular. It's everywhere. Uh, we have uh, many uh, children's stories that come about because of accounts in the scriptures, and I'm, I'm not one that is comfortable with calling the accounts in the scriptures stories, but, uh, but many, many do. Uh, they, are, they are accounts of things that have happened, and they are, they are true, and we should remember that in our lives. Uh, multitudes of people love to see the accounts within the scriptures dramatized. Uh, they love to, uh, there are, have been in, in popular culture Within my lifetime, there have been several uh, Hollywood uh, movies that have portrayed uh, biblical things. It's, it's none, it is a very popular book. It's disbelieved and rejected and it's misapplied. Uh, many people stand before groups of people, such as I am now, and they proclaim things from the word of God, but not within the proper context. And, uh, and I, I'm gonna walk that back. I'm, I'm trying to portray things in the proper context. That's not what I'm standing up here to do. And that's why I've told you to open your Bibles and to look along with me as we, as we look to, anytime we come together to study, to make sure, to make sure that we are on the same page and that the, the truth is being given uh, in what I'm saying. And even as, the, as we go through this lesson, you know, while there is going to, there is very uh, little scripture in this lesson, I want you to follow along and I want you to think about the things that I've said and I want you to find out, I want you to find out if these things are true. You know, as we think about uh, a little bit more about the Bible, we know that it's significant. It is something that has really changed history. 
uh, throughout, throughout history, from the time of, of creation, the word of God has changed things. From, we understand that the world was created by the word. We know that the word became flesh and dwelled among us, as we think of the book of John. We know that we know just how powerful the word is. We know that it is able to change men's souls. It is able to change the way that they think. It is able to save if it is followed. You know, the, the Bible being significant, it's the only uh, it's the only thing that we can really point to and point to the origin of life, as we mentioned. In Genesis, we can see the account of how mankind came about. There are many other ideas out there, but again, as we talked about this morning, uh, can we trace those things back? Can we, can we put everything together in its context and, and then also believe that there was a big bang that caused all this order out of chaos? It just doesn't make sense. When we talked this morning about trying to get to heaven by two different roads that go in two different directions, that doesn't make sense either. And it doesn't make sense for us to have a book in front of us that is so orderly, that speaks of an orderly God, that speaks of an orderly God that created mankind in such an orderly way and desired that he do things in, in an orderly way throughout his time on this earth and then expect that it just came from chaos. The Bible is significant. And uh, when we want to know about God, where else are we to look? When you think about all of the other sources of, of uh, people's gods, when, when people have a spiritual experience, so to speak, where are they looking? Oftentimes it's the words of men that they'll be looking to to find some spiritual experience. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's nature. But one thing that we find is that it's always different. And when we look at the scriptures, when we, when we look into the scriptures and study them and understand the will of the Lord for mankind, we come to the same conclusions. I know people across this country that when I've traveled I've gone across the country and I've heard the very same things that I hear from those that I've studied with and, and uh, been with in the church here in this area. When I go to Florida, I know that I, I can find the people of the book. I can find the people that are going to speak the same things. And it's not that we've sent back and forth between each other a script of things to say, but we have the word that is there. It's very significant in that it can... It can help people across the world that are separated from uh, by great distances to know the very same things. And just the fact that it's still here. All the people that have tried to destroy this book, destroy these words throughout history, and yet it is still here. It speaks to its significance. It speaks to the idea that, that it is the word of God. It's the only information relative to God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. It's where we can come to understand how those three parts of the Godhead work. How Christ can be fully God and fully man. How he could have been there in the beginning because he is the word. All those things are outlined in the scriptures and things that we can come to understand by studying and by taking everything in its proper context and studying the entirety of the scriptures as best we can. It's not the only book that refers to an afterlife yet. It's the only one whose theories are discredited, in the, especially in, in this world today. You know, if you speak of the things that we speak of here in, in the assembly, to many, they just, they think that you're, that you're crazy. They discredit those things by their own thoughts. Again, as we mentioned this morning, the thoughts of man, they're, they're foolishness uh, in, in many cases, when left to our own devices. 
But uh, when you think of the other religions out there, you know, they're, they're not so discredited. It really seems that, uh, that Christianity, that the, the religion of the Bible is discredited more often as time goes by. And, and, that, and that, that says something. That says something to, uh, again, how, how true it is. Because it's cutting through to some people's hearts. When, just like on, in Acts 2, when those first century Christians, those first Christians, when they were cut to the heart, when they, when they came to the realization that they had crucified the Lord. You know, the word did that. It did the cutting. And uh, throughout time, it still has that power. You know, the promises within the scriptures have been fulfilled. It's one of the things that we can look back and look look through the, the, uh, all of the prophecies and things that were to come true that lead, leading up to Christ and find that those things had happened. We can find hope substantiated. We can find the history of, of every scientific thing that we can find out there. The things that, that science have figured, has figured out throughout time were in many cases already in the scriptures. The idea that the earth hangeth from nothing. The idea that there was a circle of the earth. The idea that uh, in, the, in the north there's a place where there are no stars. All those things were said in the scriptures long before mankind had the ability to understand those things fully. And yet, again and again, the Bible is proven to be true over and over again. Even, we're told in the scriptures that even Satan believes, even, even the demons believe and tremble. And we can, we can see, we can see how the word of God is powerful. We can see it, if, if you've studied the scriptures and applied it to your life, you can see the power of that word. You can see the power in that word to help you to make decisions in your life to align things in your life because you have a, the mindset of, of God, the one that God wants us to have. And we have the heart that is seeking after him, and therefore we make decisions based upon those, based upon those precepts. And I'm sure that if you're sitting here today and you have named Christ and you have been obedient to his gospel and you've been buried in the waters of baptism and you've walked in uh, according to the word, you can look back and see how it has helped you throughout life. And again, if you're sitting here today and you have not put on Christ in baptism, I hope that you'll look deeper. I hope that you'll look into the scriptures and find these things that we're speaking of and find this truth that can help you to find that way that the Lord has, has put out for us, for mankind. Most of all, the Bible is, is simple. There are many people today and for many generations that have been trying to tell others that the Bible is just too confusing. I can't get past all the names. In fact, uh, in fact one, somebody here this morning gave me a book uh, of all the pronunciations of Bible names. It was a, a glossary of of Bible names that are difficult to pronounce and then how to phonetically pronounce them. I suppose they felt that, that, that I needed that. And they're, and they're probably right. Because uh, which one of us hasn't had trouble pronouncing some of those names? But nonetheless, even if we have trouble pronouncing the names, we can, we can understand the concepts. You know, the Bible's not written uh, at some high level. You know, I, when I was in college, I would pull these... Uh, these journal articles, these scholarly journal articles to read for my classes that were assigned. And, and sometimes you'd read a sentence and you'd read it again and you'd read it a third and a fourth and a fifth time and say, I don't know what they're trying to say. But when you look at the scriptures, you don't come away with that. The, the scriptures are simple. They, it's claimed that, that they can't be understood, but many times it's because people haven't tried. They've tried to read them with a closed mind or they take 
the scriptures and they kind of throw them up in the air and let the words fall and then they just kind of they kind of read in a disorganized manner they don't they don't start in such a way that they can see the whole context but what many people do will they'll search and this is one of the dangerous things in the religious world is that you'll find people that pick and choose scriptures that fit what they want to put across and you can take just about any book and do that and you can create a whole different a completely different work if you take a novel and you start selectively picking sentences you can scramble that thing up to mean to, to be completely different than the original work and that's what the religious world what men have done uh, to the Bible over over the centuries they have picked and chosen the specific scriptures that are going to fit their need in fact I know of some uh, religious sects that that uh, they, they have specific readings for specific weeks of the year they don't ever read through the entirety of the scriptures but they they know that on the first week of February this is where we're going to be reading and then they they continue through on their on their plan as it is put forth by their by their leaders but uh, never in in the entirety do they look at the scriptures they just continue with the things that they've been taught uh, as as I've heard it said before and I've mentioned it many times sometimes you have to have help to think a certain way with the scriptures you can open them up and look for yourself and that's that's about as transparent as you can get and that's what I again hope that that each and every one of one of us does when we go home after this after this lesson I hope that we open our Bibles all the more and we look into the scriptures and that we don't attack it from an from a disorganized manner but we just read it we let it say what it says we think on those things and we act upon those things that are commanded in the scriptures. And we do our best to make decisions uh, using the wisdom that comes from the scriptures. Thinking through the processes of, of how things, if we make this choice, what's that going to do for my spiritual well-being down the line? How is that going to affect my family? down the line if I if I allow this little thing to slip in uh, in my uh, say my my home if I allow uh, this little thing to slip what is that going to do down the line those of you that know me know me that I'm not and I know uh, perhaps Charles uh, I'm sorry Charles but I'm not a, a huge video game guy and, uh, and if it were up to me, there probably wouldn't be video games in my house. But video games, because of family members, uh, found their way into my house. And they certainly did take hold. And there's a difference there. There's a progression that I knew would happen. I knew that, uh, that perhaps my children would be uh, wanting to be in their rooms playing the video games longer than they would be out talking to us and doing other things. And, and that's a battle that we have to have. That's a battle that we have to have, and we have to think about that progression. And that's just one, I'm not, tell, I'm not going to stand up here and, and, and tell you that it's bad to have video games. Uh, that's not the point. But I'm just using that to illustrate you have to think about the end effects of decisions that you make. The scriptures help us to do that. It is simple in that we can look into it and we can see the mind of Christ. Many times, though, again, as we've mentioned, people fail to apply the proper context to the situation. When we look at the scriptures, and this is, you know, Bible study 101, you know, who was being spoken to and why were they speaking it? You know, what was the purpose of the speech? That's one of the first things that we need to, to take a look at. A lot of the things were spoken to specific people at a specific time. But nonetheless, we can gain, we can gain some knowledge from it. Having said these things and having mentioned that that the bible you know that it's peculiar but it's popular it's it's a significant book it has it has done much for mankind and it's simple if we just allow ourselves to honestly read it and don't listen to all the people that tell you that it is not simple 
perhaps you might want to stay away from the more difficult translations because of our culture. Uh, we don't speak with these and thous nowadays, so maybe you stay away from the King James just because it's a harder read maybe for us. But, but nonetheless, don't let that chase you away from looking into the scriptures for yourself. It is a simple, simply written book. One of the most concise. You know, I have uh, sitting on my table at home, I have a, a short stack of, of uh, commentaries. And this is a short stack of commentaries. Uh, it's uh, six or eight books. But there are other volumes and uh, other sets of commentaries that are volumes and volumes and volumes. And I mentioned this morning, I have, I have one of those larger sets at home too. All of that to talk about the things that are contained in that one book. The Bible is written very simply and very, very concisely. And we need to, uh, we need to share that with others and let other people understand and know that it is, that it is just that simple. And knowing that it is often mishandled, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility understanding that it is authoritative. And it, we must, every man must accept it, believe it, obey it, and preach it. And, and I'm uh, man and woman, mankind. We must, it is upon every one of us to accept it and believe it and obey it and do what the Lord has asked to do. And we must not alter it. If we go to Revelation 22, let's go on over to Revelation 22. And we'll read a little bit about how we shouldn't change the Bible. How we don't want to be those that, that alter it and try to change it to meet our thinking. Revelation 22, starting at verse 18, says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now this, we understand that the book of Revelation was written at a time and to a people that were being persecuted. And it's a book that speaks of the victory of Christ over all of the things that, have, that were plaguing the people at that time. But nonetheless, we can, we can garner from that text that the Lord doesn't like his word to be changed. We can understand from the accounts in the Old Testament that the Lord speaks and he means what he says and he doesn't want things to be changed. If he says to speak to the rock, he means speak to it, not strike it. If he says strike it, he means strike it, not speak to it. The, the, the scriptures are authoritative. And as such, as human beings, as those under the sway of the Lord, those under his authority, we have to be those that obey it. We have to live by it. We will die and we will be judged by it. All, man, all mankind will be judged by the words contained within the scriptures. Just like when we were in, in high school or perhaps middle school. I had a teacher in middle school that used to allow us to have an open book test. He would let us grade our own papers. He would leave the, he would leave the uh, key, the answer key up on the desk and when we were done, uh, we would just go up and grade our own papers. And nobody failed that class, interestingly. But uh, in like manner, we have the answers. We have the, the answer key right here. And we have everything that, that will be judged by, we, we can look into the scriptures and know those words by which we will be judged. And uh, it is up to each and, every, each and every person to come to the knowledge of truth. That is, after all, the Lord's desire that all men come to the knowledge of truth. Now, we must be those that look into the word, take it for what it is, and don't change it. 
You know, 2 Timothy 2.15, which we mentioned earlier today, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is what is squarely on our shoulders. If we do that, then we have that promise of everlasting life. If we act upon those things that we come to know in the scriptures, if we use the examples given in the scriptures to pattern our own lives. You know, the word of God is powerful, and we know that Romans 10 at verse 17 reminds us that if we hear the word, not just, you know, there are, there are those, as we mentioned earlier, that can just recite words from the Bible, but they, they're not actually hearing what they're saying, and they're not looking in to hear what the word of God is saying. But if we hear the word, we gain faith. If we really start to put two and two together and look into the scriptures, we can come to see a picture of our Lord. We can see a picture of what he desires for mankind. And we, we believe then what he or who he is. And then uh, just like those <clears throat> and, uh, that are outlined in the scriptures in Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, once he heard the word, he believed. And Acts 2, again, those when they heard of Christ and heard what they'd done to him and it really cut to the heart, they believed. They repented, they were sorrowful and desired to do better, desired to turn and walk away from those things. They left their lives behind. One of the things, if you continue reading in Acts, that first century church, they left behind a lot. They then banded together and supported each other and helped each other and got each other through the next difficult days. But they turned away from those old things. They turned away from the sin that separated them from, from the Lord. They confessed him before men. They were no longer ashamed. They were willing to stand up and confess Christ and be baptized for the remission of sins. And again, as we often talk about baptism, sometimes uh, maybe it doesn't make sense. And maybe when you talk to people, when you share the gospel with others, maybe you'll come to a person who just doesn't understand why they should just get into a pool of water and get wet. What, what sense does that make? But that there is the stuff of faith. If we believe that he is, we're going to do what he said. And he said to be baptized for the remission of sins. Knowing that when we, once we do that, we're raised to walk in that newness of life. And that's where we get back to Revelation. Revelation 2.10, as we say at the end of every lesson, it reminds us that if we're faithful until death, we'll receive that crown of life. So as we are sitting here today, together this evening, I ask you have, you, have you been faithful? Do you need the prayers of the saints? You know, we're gathered together here. You know, it's commanded of us that we come together and worship the Lord. But one of the other things that I'm convinced is that when we come together like this, we have this opportunity to support each other and to be a family one to another. I've mentioned it many times that you, you people are my family and uh, the Lord's people are my family throughout the, throughout the world. And I've been blessed with the opportunity to meet many of them. And it's because of this bond and the and the help that we have one from another that we can stand strong against the things that would drag us down when we open when we open the door and leave this building when we turn on the television when we turn on our car radios we hear all sorts of things angela and i were watching a, a show between services here this afternoon and a commercial came on we couldn't run fast enough to the remote to turn it off it's just shocking what what society has considered to be valuable in their entertainment and uh, we must remain faithful together that's what we that's what we uh, one of the reasons that we come together to, to build each other up and so can we be that help to you today do you need to put on Christ in baptism today then by all means don't wait another moment if we can be of assistance to you let it be known as we stand and sing Christ, you